let's switch over to Tesla's We Robot event. If you didn't see this, check it out. Google Tesla's We Robot event. And it was this big, fancy Hollywood esque, you know, it was actually on a Hollywood movie studio. If you've seen videos or pictures from it, I mean, it was a, it was totally stereotypical Hollywood glam, all for, you know, the paparazzi and, and show and all this. And in that same vein, it was <laughs> a very Hollywood esque type event in that there's a whole lot of hot air and smoke and mirrors going on at this thing. Nothing is as it seems at the event. And more of that is starting to come out. Now, the big things, there were two big things at the event. And it was a little bit of like, here's the future. Come to the We Robot event and see the future is now, you know, that kind of whole marketing thing around it. And so at the We Robot event, there's the cyber cab was the big thing, you know, like, look, cyber cab, the future of transport, the cyber cabs, it's going to be $30,000 for these things. And you're never going to have to drive anywhere. They're just going to pick you up. You're going to be autonomous. We're going to have autonomous vehicles everywhere. And then you get into the event and there's Tesla bots just walking around everywhere. They're serving you your drinks and they're engaging you in conversation and, you know, all this stuff. And I mean, again, videos, pictures, well done. Well done. It looks cool. It's neat. It's again, on the surface level, kind of like the rocket being captured by the tower. You go, wow, what an incredible marvel in modern technology and where the near future will be. But then once the glitz and the glam kind of wears off and <laughs> the endorphins get out of your system and you start going, hey, all right, now what really is going on here? Now they're already starting to take criticism on the whole event for a couple of reasons. So I'll focus on the Tesla bots first and then we'll go, or the, yeah, Tesla bot. And then we'll go to the cyber cab. So the Tesla bot, one of the things that people picked up on right away was the way these bots were talking with guests. People were like, it, and at first it felt like, wow, what an innovation. This, this whole new model of AI conversation is so, so human-like. And then it was almost one of those people started going, wait a minute, it is so human-like. In fact, it sounds and feels like I'm talking to a human, which grew suspicions, which were then later confirmed that, well, I mean, the Tesla bots were being controlled remotely. And you were talking to a human. You weren't talking to AI. And suddenly that starts casting some shade on things like, oh, wait, wait. And this is what happens. Once the veneer starts falling off, all of a sudden you start seeing like, oh, the drywall's rotten. <laughs> the two by four studs are starting to fall apart. Like things start coming. Oh, the electric is actually just a bunch of power cords, <laughs> extension cords run through the wall. And you start to see that, oh, this isn't quite, the glitz and the glam on the event. Now, to be fair, to my knowledge and in looking into this, the Tesla bots were actually, AI was controlling them moving around and doing certain things, which I kind of suspected based on the video. It wasn't like wait staff, human wait staff. <laughs> like if you cared about efficiency and experience, you probably wouldn't want a bunch of these Tesla bots running your restaurant. And the videos were pretty, I mean, you just watch a video, you'd be like, oh yeah, I don't know that I would want it unless I was just doing this as a spectacle, which is what this was. <laughs> you wouldn't want these AI bots as your server, per, trust me. But they wanted it to feel human and they know AI can't feel human. And so they had people at microphones <laughs> like talking. So, you know, the wallpaper is falling off a little bit and you're like, oh, okay, not quite what it seems. And then the, the, uh, what's it? The cyber cabs. So then it gets to the cyber cabs. And again, it looks cool. It's neat. You know, these fancy gold cars are pulling up and doing all this stuff autonomously. And then, uh, if you don't know who Marquise Brownlee is, he's a YouTuber and he, he kind of dug into the smoke and mirrors on the cyber cabs you know like 
how because the claim was like we are on the verge of these things thirty thousand dollars are going to be everywhere it's going to take over autonomous vehicles and you know that's it we're never going to nobody's going to drive anywhere ever again and he starts poking holes in it a little bit so some of his stuff and i won't get into all of his critique but he's legit on this he was looking at it his primary primary take on it was just the design impracticality of some of this and even some of the so how exactly would you say this is going to work again so you know all the vehicles they've got like two seats she's like well i mean as a dad of eight and a wife family of 10 i don't know i i'd have to have a minimum of five just to do anything that's not terribly practical so he's going all right he's he's kind of picking apart the doors going you know, these Lam Lambo doors aren't super ideal for anything. There's no rear visibility in it. There's zero manual overrides in this. So while all for, you know, the idealistic, wouldn't it be great if you never had anything and could just trust AI 100%, like you built that into the design that there's no way if things goes off the rails to, <laughs> to intervene, like what if, it just dies and you just need somebody to move it. You, you can't, you literally can't do anything with this, which if you followed anything about autonomous vehicles, they don't have the best track record. Let's just say that they can do some cool stuff, but even people who are very pro autonomous vehicles that I've talked to are like, yeah, but I always want to have the ability to take over if something's not going right, or if something's malfunctioning or a light comes on and maybe I just don't feel very good. Or even just personally, I know tons of driving enthusiasts, tons of driving enthusiasts. I myself sometimes just like to get in my Suburban and go for a drive for no reason other than just to be behind the wheel, feel like I'm in control in my own world. You know, the world is my oyster and I can go out and just drive around for a little bit. And so to say, we're going to completely get rid of the possibility of that. I think there's a lot of people who would go, I, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I like that. And then when you look at how these things are charged, this is one of the things Marquise got rightfully. So it's like, how do you charge them? Oh, well they are wirelessly charged. There's no external port to charge this thing. So all the roads will just have wireless stuff in them. And you go, our infrastructure is not set up this way at all. Like we don't, what are we going to rip up every road on the planet to try and make this thing work? Like, how's that going to happen? And granted, one of the things I think we have to be careful of, and I know having worked in the corporate sector for a long time, that can be frustrating is when people have really cool ideas like this, and then people are just pissing all over them. Yeah, well, that's not going to work because that you, did, bleh, you didn't do that. Why didn't you think of that? Oh, that's dumb. You can't have that. And that's really frustrating. And I get it. And it would be easy to pick apart any innovation. I mean, I remember being one of the people who was responsible for convincing organizations to implement mobile smartphones at the time. And people did the same thing. Mobile smartphones. Who wants more than a phone on their phone? What a stupid idea. Yeah, well, look where we are now. So I think we have to be careful that we don't completely dismiss everything. But if you know anything about the Cybertruck, I mean, let's just say Tesla doesn't have the best track record of thinking through some of the practicalities of how does this work in the real world? This may sound great and work great in concept in a complete hyper- you know, idealized, everything's designed around this working, yeah, then it works great. But that's not the world we live in. We live in a broken, dysfunctional world where nothing goes according to plan. And even when the response to, so how would you handle this? There is no response or it hasn't been considered. That's a problem. I mean, I just think going back to the Cybertruck one, not only have people <laughs> seen the things where like it's breaking people's fingers and the hoods and, you know, stuff like that. But even Whistling Diesel is, he's a YouTuber where, you know, it supposedly has this toy capacity and all this stuff. And he proved the thing like you pull a trailer 
too hard, it'll literally snap the whole frame and send your trailer smashing into you. And that's in light use. So again, it's not that we should tear apart every objection. And I tend to be more of the, let's go for it and see what happens. But I actually really appreciate when people start thinking about this stuff and going, yeah, but what about this? Or what about this? So that it at least forces you to go, that's a good point. We hadn't thought about that. How would we handle that? And it was pretty clear based on the We Robot event. A lot of those moments have not been happening. Or if they're brought up, it's never mind that. We're going to live in our utopian world that isn't real type of a thing. Um, the final thing, though, that I would add on this, because I do see things based on where it is, even if it's not really going to be $30,000, even if it's not going to be released in early 2025, you know, it's not going to take over the world in the next 18 months. I do think there is going to be, and will continue to be, there already is significant impact on jobs with this kind of stuff. And it's coming very quick. And I just think about the number of, you know, people who, who drive Uber or, or Instacart drivers or all this other stuff. And you go, I mean, this really does have the potential to impact jobs at some point. And is the timeline, are we equipped to help people adapt in time? Because let's say hypothetically, $30,000 cyber cabs can be purchased and used and it works according to the, the specs and how the ideal situation. If that truly were the case, it would just wipe out a lot of drivers because it'd be like, well, why would we for 30 grand, I'll buy one and it'll take me wherever I need to go, you know, at any point and whatever. And I'll just have Walmart drop the stuff in my car and then have it come right back. I don't, I don't need to pay Instacart to do it. I'll just have it. So it would dramatically change things. And I do think this is an area that you know, we aren't putting enough investment into is helping people one. And it's part of what I'm doing with the show is to help people recognize, Hey, this change is coming. It is, you know, as much as I joke and make fun of this whole thing, this kind of stuff is coming. And there are people whose livelihoods depend on driving. And so what are we doing to help prepare them? How are we making sure they're aware this stuff's coming? How do we get companies to start thinking about, okay, so what could those people do? And how do we get those people prepared to go, these are the new skill, skill sets you're going to need in this world. Um, and I think that's something we need to spend a lot more time on. Uh, but that was not the focus. <laughs> that was definitely not the focus of the We Robot event. Unless you want to take into consideration your future job can be sitting behind a microphone like this, pretending to be a robot and talking to people. I don't know what you would call that job description, but there you go. There's a future job for 2025.